Welcome back to the Friday Five for March 31st, 2023. My name is Andrew Ayers. I'm an estate planning and business law attorney with offices in Edina, Minnesota and New York City. And we're going to look at five questions from the week that came up in uh, different consultations and calls with clients. Short questions, short answers, maybe some things that have crossed your mind. Question number one this week, what's the difference between a personal representative, a guardian and a trustee? So these are three pretty common terms you'll find in your will, especially if you have children under the age of 18. So the first one is the personal representative, also called an executor in some states. That is the person who's going to be in charge of dealing with the court and rounding up your estate after you're gone. So if the will has to be filed with the court, we have to file other documents, maybe an accounting. That's your personal representative who's in charge of gathering up all of your money and making sure it gets to where it needs to go under your will. Second person is the guardian. The guardian would be the person who's going to take over for you as the guardian of your children if you're gone. So when we have married couples, we'll often do what's called a testamentary trust, which is a trust built into their will that'll have a guardianship provision that says if at the time of the second of the two of us to die, there is a child of ours that's under the age of 18, we want to appoint a guardian. And it's important if you have young children that we appoint a guardian so that we don't have to go through a court system to be able to figure out where your kids should end up, especially if you have some siblings that you really wouldn't want to have custody and guardianship over your children. You don't want them raising your children. We want to make sure you have a will that clearly spells out who you want to be the guardian. And the third term would be the trustee. So the trustee in this testamentary trust we're talking about would be the person who manages the money on behalf of the children. So if these children are under 18, or you can even pick a different age in your will, then we need to have somebody to manage the money for them, and that would be the trustee. And as a follow-up to this question, what I'm commonly asked is, can the same person be the personal representative, the guardian, and the trustee? And the answer is yes, they can be. But you want to look in your life and see who's going to be involved and make sure you're picking the best person for each role. And in some situations, that may, that may be the same person for all three roles. And in other situations, it may be a different person for each one. Question number two, is my will invalid if I have another child? So this came up in the context of a client. We're redoing the will. We're going through the estate plan and looking at the different documents they have. And the last time their documents were drafted, they only had two children. And so since that time, they've had a third child. And they were concerned because of what happens to my will now? Because we clearly named our first two children, but our third child wasn't born when we did it. Well, you want to look at the language of your will, and most properly drafted wills will have a provision that says that identifies your current children that are alive and also includes any future children that are born. They're called afterborn children. And so you want to make sure if you have an estate plan and you have young children and you may have more children in the future that you have the right language in your will so that you don't have to worry about this. Now the flip side is it's not a hard fix. We can do a codicil to add this new child to the will, but it's another step in the process to make sure that if you don't get to that codicil immediately, your will is still protecting your legacy with your children. Question number three, what state should I do my prenup in? So this was an interesting question because the prospective client lived in the United States, the prospective client's fiance lives overseas, and we were trying to figure out where we're going to do this prenup and where it should be located. Should it be a U.S.-based prenup? Should it be overseas? So that question was easily answered because the uh, soon-to-be spouse was going to be moving to the United States. So we at least know which country we're going to be in. But then step two is where should that prenup be drafted? And in this case, the prenup is going to be drafted where the U.S. citizen is living. So you should understand that a prenuptial agreement is going to be a creation of your state law because it's state law that governs divorces, it's state law that governs marriages. So when we're looking at prenuptial agreement, it's not common for you to go forum shopping, which is trying to pick some state around the country that's going to have the best law for you. Realistically, you want your prenup to be based where you are when you're getting married and based under those laws, presuming that they're going to be familiar with your marriage and it may be the court that would have to deal with any divorce action. Um, however, if you get married in New York and then you later move to Arizona and then you get divorced 30 years later in Arizona, that Arizona court can still enforce your New York prenup, but you don't always know where you're going to be living at the time you're getting married. So my advice is normally to do it in the state where you and your soon-to-be spouse will be living. Question number four this week was a real interesting call I got. It was from a gentleman in Texas. And we were discussing the idea of a dynasty trust. 
Um, so there's no such thing as a dynasty trust in the states where I practice law. So we had to do a little bit of research as we were on the phone and go through some of the iterations. And what we learned is that in September 1st of 2021, Texas enacted a law that allows you, <coughs> excuse me, to do what's called a dynasty trust, meaning a trust that can last for 300 years. Now, if you're not in Texas, chances are you're not going to be able to take advantage of this trust. This is a Texas-based law. But if you're in Texas and you have a trust that you want to leave for generations in your family, perhaps you own some farmland, you own a business, you want to make sure it's protected for the real long term at this point, if you're in Texas, you can look at what they uh, call a dynasty trust. Question number five from that same fun phone call was actually, can I use my existing trust to hold my business ownership? And so as a general principle, a question I get a lot from people is, you know, what's the difference between a business trust and a personal trust? And the simple answer is there, nece there isn't necessarily a difference. They can be the same thing. You can have a trust that has a variety of different assets that it owns, including a business, some real estate, uh, other assets that you may have. Uh, the bigger question in this case was, do we want to have a separate trust for the business aside from the family trust that this gentleman was going to try to turn into a dynasty trust? And in that case, you need to look under Texas law to see whether or not a dynasty trust could own a business. However, if you have a trust that you've set up or if you're looking to set one up, you don't necessarily have to set up an individual trust for each different asset. Um, a lot of people confuse this with the LLC for rental properties or LLC for investments. And in that case, we normally will recommend that you put each property into its own LLC for liability protection so that the liability on one property doesn't flow through to the other properties. But when we're dealing with the trust and possibly owning a business, own, uh, owning part of your business, we want to make sure that we understand if we can do it all in one trust or do we need to break it out and do a set of trusts. So that's our five questions from this week. Here in Minnesota, we had a glimpse of spring, but now we're getting hit with another snowstorm tonight. So it looks like winter's coming back around for us. But hopefully by the time we talk next Friday, the weather will be slowly warming up here. We'll have a little less snow. So there'll be a link in the description for information about future episodes and also where you can leave questions if you have a question you'd like me to answer next week or in the future. If you found this video helpful, I'd love it if you can hit the like button. You can go over to YouTube and subscribe to the channel for all the future Friday Fives. And wherever you are, I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you next week.